Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I have a special guest. His name is Jack Creer, aka Jack Roaming, hailing all the way from Luxembourg. He's got experience traveling all over the planet, longtime digital nomad. Jack, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks, man. I, I know you've been a fan of My Latin Life for a while and kind of, you know, engaging with a lot of uh, the people in the community, be it Mark Zolo, etc. Uh, I think you're also one interesting aspect of your uh, online profiles that you have 43,000 followers on Medium. So I'm curious uh, to talk about Medium because <laughs> we, okay. we have one that's that's not too much used. But yeah, and you have an interesting Instagram, you know, you're traveling all over Brazil, Mexico, Guatemala, Asia, Africa, a little bit everywhere. So definitely a, a global citizen. And we're really happy to have you on the podcast to talk about, you know, being a digital nomad, travel hacks, making money online, and a little bit of everything. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I've been a digital nomad for around about three years now. And as you mentioned, I like to spend time in different regions. So I usually stay in, in one region for a few months and then I go to the next one. So yeah, right now mm -hmm. I'm in Brazil. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking forward to having a, a discussion about digital nomadism and Latin America, because I think we are both big fans of that region as well. Definitely. So you're in Brazil. I'm in Mexico. I love Brazil as well. But I also love and really respect guys that... <laughs> <laughs> pause but i really uh i really respect guys that have uh basically traveled to different regions who are not just like the latin america guy but people who can also uh who have traveled say eastern europe southeast asia and they have that yeah. global perspective and they can sort of compare and contrast regions because there's a there, there's a lot of guys that kind of you know base up in in mexico or brazil or whatever but uh, there's not that many guys that have really been to every digital nomad region, every interesting region of the planet, and kind of have that that larger macro perspective. So uh, really cool to hear. I, I always love hearing about sort of the, the comparison yeah. and contrasts and stuff like that. Yeah, so I, I believe that every region in the world has some, you know, benefits and disadvantages for digital nomads. So I don't think that one particular region like Latin America or Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe is perfect. I believe that they all have their, you know, parts which are really good for digital nomads, people who work remotely. And they then they have, you know, parts that are not so good downsides. But mm -hmm. of course, there are some hotspots where like most digital nomads go or where you will find a... a large community but yeah i think that it's uh, it's really great to get a, a bigger perspective for as a digital nomad because that will also help you to find out mm -hmm. which one is for you because there's i think that there's types of digital nomads who really succeed in latin america and other types who are much more comfortable and successful in in eastern europe for example definitely and so how long have you been aware of my latin life through the blog uh, I would say I, so the first time I traveled to um, South America was in 2016. So I went to Chile and Argentina that on that trip. And I think that that was when I first discovered my Latin life. So I think it was fairly new back then. Mm -hmm. And I, what I really liked was the city guides. So um, back then, my Latin life had some city guides, which were more like, you know, very informal and very just... Uh, they just gave you a little bit of information. They weren't like tourist guides, mm -hmm. like best things to do. They were mm -hmm. basically just like, this is where you stay. This is where you go out. This is how much it costs. And I really enjoyed that because it was so simple and you could just use them. They were very user-friendly. Uh, yeah, that's how I, how I discovered my Latin life. Mm -hmm. And even before my Latin life, you were aware of Mark Zolo and a couple of the, the OGs. Yeah, definitely. So uh, Naughty Nomad was probably the first blog I read in, in my entire life, uh, around about 2012, 13. And his first book came out around that time, I think. And yeah, I was just really, you know, 
I really enjoyed reading about his his adventures because he was also one of the only bloggers that just talked about crazy crazy adventures with <laughs> dangerous situations. I mean, there, there I don't yeah. know if there were any others when when he started at least. So I mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that that type of content. And this was before YouTube, of course, before people were making YouTube videos like that. I agree. I agree. There, there's not too many people that really give you like the rawness, the the crazy stories, and I always respected that. And I've always, um, I've always had a soft spot for adventure travel, and I think you as well. You consider yourself more of yeah. an adventure travel person. Yeah. So I, I usually, you know, I my current um, routine, if I can say, is that I usually stay in one place for around about three or four weeks and that's when I, I get my work done and you know I usually stay in, in in one city and then after that I will do a more adventurous trip for example when last year I did just I drove nearly 2,000 kilometers across Turkey like all of oh, Turkey wow. basically and I also went to Morocco when you know during during all the lockdowns so it, it was a little bit complicated but worked out and yeah last last year i also went to mexico and i went to you know i purposefully went to the states where not so many tourists go so i didn't go to the main tourist hubs i just went to like hidalgo for example which is not a very visited state i also went to querétaro mm-hmm. and sinaloa and you know many different states which are not so much on the on the main radar and i just like to go into these places which are not full of tourists and i just like to talk to people that's basically my my favorite thing to do is like go to a market or go to you know a a local place and just ask people what they think about about their their region their state their city and then they usually give me very good tips as well which is how you i think it's how you learn about the culture and it's how you also find really good places that are not overrun by by tourists I 100% agree. I'm in Sinaloa right now in Mazatlan. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So you really specifically seek out the off the beaten path locations. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Because I've been so I've been to 61 countries now. And I've kind of seen like most of the most famous cities in the world. And now I'm basically trying to visit more offbeat places. So for example, I've been to like in Mexico. I've been to the to the Riviera Maya, to the Tulums, the Cancuns, all these places. I've been there, but now I'm I'm a lot more interested in just going to more offbeat places. And so what I usually do is that, as I mentioned before, I just find myself a base somewhere. Which, for example, in Mexico, it could be Mexico City because it's just so well connected. And then from mm-hmm. there, we just try to go into places which are a little bit less uh, well known. And there's usually a lot of beauty to find in these places. You know, sometimes places are well known because of one particular site that they really promote. But then there's pretty much the same site in another state, which doesn't get so much marketing. And then, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you won't have as many tourists there. I mean, if you are, you are, you are well familiar with, uh, with Mexico, so you probably know that there's a lot of really nice Maya sites and Aztec sites in Mexico mm-hmm. that really nobody knows about really because they are just not they don't get the marketing that that the chichen itzas and the tulums get you know yeah people think that there's just chichen itza and maybe one or two other sites but there's actually well over a hundred a lot of them are pretty deep in the jungle but there's a lot yeah yeah and also you know i think that the best way to travel in any country is that you just Try to meet local people. And this is obviously, I think we're going to get to that a little bit later. This goes a lot with learning languages. And you just try to meet local people and they will, they will show you where to go. So they will, they will have a lot better information usually than, than, you know, the guides you can find online or, or in, in traditional places. So I just think that if you have local connections, it's always the best way in, in any country, whether it's Africa or Turkey or, Brazil, no matter where. Definitely. And so how do you personally go about finding these off the beaten path places? And how do you determine if it's one that appeals to you and that sort of strikes a good balance between, you know, you think you'll be able to get work done, um, but also have a, an authentic experience? Yeah, so, so I personally, I really like to stay in cities for at least you know 
two or three weeks at a time because and sometimes a month because i just think that if you are in a big city and you're there and you have to get work done you just can't get an experience in a few days it's just impossible you need more time so i do like to to travel to many places but i still consider myself a fairly slow traveler and mm -hmm. i usually try the capital cities in each country because usually not a, it's not the case in every country but in most countries the capital cities just have the best infrastructure and they also have the best transportation usually to to most places mm -hmm. And then when I'm in the capital city, I will book maybe uh, a place to stay for like two or three weeks. And then from there, I will plan the rest. That's, for example, if we look at um, uh, here, well, here in Brazil, obviously, it's not the case because it's Brasilia. But if you are in Rio, for example, or in Sao Paulo, there's so many places to go from there and they just have the best transportation. So you can go to Rio. That's what I did, for example, a few a few weeks ago i just went to rio spent a few weeks there and then i met local people and then i i just did my research and now i ended up in a small you know like beach town which is much better than most other beach towns that i've been to because i got this local local tip so that's that's mm -hmm. basically how i go about it yeah i like it and which town are you in now i'm in a town which is called busios and it's actually mm -hmm. i don't know if you've heard of it yeah of it's course. actually quite famous among Argentinians. So there's a lot of Argentinians here. It's actually the mm -hmm. only place I've been so far where you can speak Spanish to everyone in uh, <laughs> in Brazil, which is very handy because, as you know, with the Portuguese, it's, it's a bit difficult sometimes. Um, and yeah, and after that, I'm going to, a, to another town and then probably back to Rio. But I usually plan a few weeks in advance, but not too, not too much because... It's just, I don't want to be completely inflexible. But on the other hand, I also need to get work done and to have some steady internet sometimes, which, as you know, is a bit of a problem sometimes in, in Latin America. Definitely, yeah. I know uh, Buzios, it's right. Um, it's like two hours east of Rio, uh, still in the state of Rio de Janeiro, yeah. near Ajao do Cabo and Cabo Frio. Yes. And uh, it's known, it was originally... Uh, Buzios originally kind of became famous because I think a French actress Brigitte or singer Bardot. went went in like the 1950s yeah. or 60s and kind of put it on the map. And now it's sort of like a playground for the rich of Brazil. And apparently it's a lot more. I haven't been, but I know it's like a little bit more expensive than most places in Brazil, but safer, quite touristic. I think there's like cobblestone streets in the center, right? Yeah. And uh, it's... Um, Seems like a cool place. Like when I think about how much the Brazilian real has, has dropped in value, the currency, and I was like, hmm, it'd be kind of cool to pick up, um, buy a house in Brazil. One of the first places that came to mind was Buzios. Yeah. So, so what I can tell you about Buzios, yeah, it's, it's probably, I mean, it's probably the safest place I've seen so far in Brazil. So I don't think there's any safety issues here because it's also, it's quite far away from any big city. So there's not like this, you know, there's the big cities where you have the bad areas right next to it. That's really not the case here. It's too far to go uh, into any big city from here. And yeah, as, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, it's full of Argentinians. So most of the tourists are Argentinians. Very, very few like Argenti um sorry, Americans or Canadians, Europeans, very, very few. And then there's obviously right. Brazilians coming here. But yeah, I know I know it has this reputation of being a bit more upscale, but it's still I mean it's still reasonable. It's not like an expensive place compared to anything, you know, western standards. So it's still still right. fairly reasonable, yeah. But yeah, it's very chilled out and it's kind of a place which I know it's 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 famous because of Brigitte Bardot who came who was a French actor in the in the 60s and she came here in the um in the 60s as well, but Personally, I didn't know that because, you know, it was a long time ago. So that's only, <laughs> I only knew about that because the Brazilians told me. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's cool because it's close to Cabo Frio and you can take it like a half hour Uber to get into this bigger city where there's a little more partying and stuff and a little bit yeah. more uh, stores and stuff if you really need it. Yeah. So as a, as a digital nomad location, I think it's pretty good. Just because, mm -hmm. I mean, the Wi-Fi is still decent. It's not too bad. And, um, yeah, it's very safe. It's very chilled out. Like, there's, there's not... If you if you like these chilled out places, which are more laid back, then it's a really good place to come. And it's still quite quite close to Rio, like three hours by, by bus. 
And um, yeah, so Busios is definitely a good location. I think that we, so I was at the carnival before uh, last week and um, it's just a perfect yeah. place to come after the carnival when you've just been partying for like three days straight. <laughs> then you need somewhere to just, you know, lie down a little bit and relax and yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Okay, good. Let me ask you about Brazilian Carnival then, because I'm here in Mazatlan, uh, which is the biggest uh, carnival in Mexico. Uh, it's huge. It's huge. Like it, pre-COVID, like a million people would go, like descend from all over. But what, what's cool is that Carnival in Mexico is really mostly um, Mexican tourists coming from other parts of Mexico, coming from Durango and Torreon and Culiacan yeah. and stuff like that. And they come down to Mazatlan and it's, you know, it's pretty family friendly compared to Brazilian carnival, I imagine. Yeah. Um, and it's a good time. And it was actually, I, I was thinking about going to Brazil for a carnival, um, you know, in January, I was kind of like, Hmm, what am I going to be doing this year? Um, and I know that officially, uh, they pushed the official Rio carnival to like August or something of this year. But I mean, Brazilians are still going to party anyway, or like, so what's, Course. how's that working? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, so the, the main parades, which are actually two parades, which are um, organized by the Escola do Samba. And these mm -hmm. were, these were postponed, but I'm not sure now if it's April or August. I don't think it's August because August is like the coldest month in Rio, or at least it's not the, the main, uh, I mean, it's never right. that cold in Rio, but I think it was April or it was pushed back to April. But to be honest, I mean, I was there a few days ago and um, the, the street parties were exactly the same as always. It was just <laughs> completely out of control. And uh, <laughs> it's basically the really cool thing about Carnival. Well, I, I, I mean, it was my first Carnival in, in Brazil. And the, the thing I really enjoyed is that basically there's so much spontaneous stuff going on. Like you can, sometimes you have one bar then they organize something and there's like thousands of people coming there and they only announce it, you know, maybe one day before or two days before. So you, it's really this spontaneous nature of carnival, which, you know, most Brazilians, they, they, they will tell you anyways that the real carnival is a street carnival, not the big parades because, you know, the parades you have to pay uh, to get a seat to see them. So it's not really, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it's it's basically like in a not a stadium, but they just put up yeah, spectators. It's, it's stands. called a in in Spanish. It's called a hipodromo. Yeah, hipodromo, exacto. Yeah, uh, yeah. So 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 most Brazilian people in Rio they don't even go there. Like they they will watch it on TV and then they will just party in the streets. And so we went to three different street parties and they were absolutely on fire. Like there were, I mean, I don't I I don't have really have something to compare it to. So I haven't been to Rio before the pandemic. So I, but the, the Brazilians I met, they told me that it was pretty much the same. Like last year, it was much smaller because they were still street parties last year, but the police got more involved. But this time, the police, they, right. you know, they didn't say anything. They were just there, uh, just right. looking, basically. Yeah. And so, did you find that people were still coming in from out of town, or was it mostly yeah. uh, people from Rio that were partying? Absolutely. So there were a lot of Brazilians from all over the country coming. And also quite a lot of Europeans and Americans. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I don't have anything to compare it to, but I was just like Rio. It was as full as I mean, as I could imagine it to be. And also, the prices were double during the carnival, so they were still applying the carnival prices anyway. And yeah, I mean, I met a, a lot of people from from all over the world basically coming. So it might have been a little bit less, but it was still Rio was packed. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I've only been to Rio once, but I spent a month there in late 2020. I think it was November, no, December 2020. And it was really cool because everyone was pretty uh, scared about Corona and stuff at that point in time. And so I felt like I was the only gringo in Rio, uh, which is amazing because yeah. often one of the biggest complaints is that there's too many gringos and, you know, there's not that much... Um, gringo factor in terms of like feeling like a oh. celebrity but but when i went i was like the only guy and i was like this is sick i mean uh airbnbs like no one you know what i mean like there's a lot of or not not high occupancy so uh airbnbs were like 20 25 bucks a night or something like right on ipanema yeah. beach right on copacabana beach um and i had a sick time like doing all the hikes waterfalls stuff like that it was unreal yeah, that's definitely not the case at the moment. 
So I guess you came for f- at the right moment. But yeah, mm-hmm. that's always something that was personally. So I've traveled all, you know, the the entire pandemic basically. I've traveled except for one Same. month, and and I was I, it was like that in most places. Like when I was in Morocco, for example, I was the only foreigner, like everywhere. And mm-hmm. even, you know, Morocco is very famous for having these tourist touts, which are very aggressive and they are aggressive, but they were just not there because they thought there's no, but no tourists. That's here, so funny. There's no point even that's, coming out. that's really funny. So yeah, no, it was like that in Morocco and the, there were five star hotels, you know, which were like 30, $40 a night. So it was really amazing. And yeah, it just, this, this, this time will probably not come back anytime soon. So it's great that you made it to Rio because yeah, I now saw Rio. I would say it was at not maybe full full capacity, but it was very very high occupancy and and it's really really full. And also, you know, in Lapa, there there are all the street parties as well for um, mm-hmm. for carnival. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, I just every second foreigner I met just got robbed. So yeah, it's a bit. No uh, way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the Brazilians told me just take an old cell phone to the carnival and some bills, nothing more, because there's just too many. You know, it's not violence People. robbing. It's just that they try to pickpocket you, like especially in uh, Lapa. But yeah, yeah. And for for context for listeners, Lapa is like sort of like the center downtown of Rio, and it's famous for the street parties and this like one party that's on this like stair set of stairs. But it's also like really run down, and you and you roll up, and you're like, holy shit, this is ghetto. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, like the center of Rio is really not the most beautiful place in the world, but the party, the party was amazing. It's just that, yeah, you just have to be very careful and have your wits about you all the time. Which, I mean, if you expect it, then it's fine because you just know how to deal with it. But if you're not ready for it, then yeah, you might have tr- uh, trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, th- this is actually good timing that we're having this conversation because I think maybe the episode. Before this one comes out, I think the episode that'll come out before is a Moroccan guy who lives in Brazil. His name is Adil Math, A D I L M A F, and he's a really interesting guy. He's kind of like a crypto uh, guy, uh, YouTuber, and he's just a, a Moroccan guy. You know, speaks French and all that, and he's living in uh, Balneario Camboriú down in Santa Catarina. I'm sure you've oh, heard yeah, of, the, yeah. of the town. And yeah, uh, yeah maybe, maybe if, if if you're looking to head down that way, I, I could uh, introduce you guys. Um, that that being said, so kind of like a Morocco Brazil connection there. But so what what is your plan now that Carnival's over uh, in terms of Brazil? Are you going to explore like the north of Brazil, or what do you, what do you have in mind? Um, I actually I'm going to leave Brazil in uh, probably one or two weeks because I also want to see. I mean, I've, this year I'm I'm trying to visit. A few new countries as well and mm-hmm. i've been to many countries in south america but there are also a few that i haven't been to yet so i'm moving to another south american country and before that i am not so sure yet maybe i mean it's not really worth going to the northeast just for one week i think it's you need more time right it's pretty so far. i might so i might just check out some more places here in the um in the area of uh, rio because you know the state of rio where is yeah. there's a lot of cool places here not just rio itself yeah, I would have loved to check out Petropolis, but I know they just had those like crazy yeah. mudslides and and kind of a bad situation, so it wouldn't be a good time to visit. Maybe I I, I always thought it would be cool to go to uh, Juiz de Fora. I think you pronounce it like that. It's like halfway between Rio and Belo Horizonte, um, and it's like an inland town, sort of like in the mountains. That I imagine not a lot of gringos go to. It's probably got a, definitely over half a million people, and. Okay. Um, would be kind of a kind of a cool spot to check out. Definitely easy bus connection from Rio. So Juiz would be like J U I Z uh, G four. Okay. Um, so kind of a cool like that's, off the beaten path spot. That's some cool uh, recommendations. So I, I'll yeah, and there's there's another there's also another one uh, halfway between Rio and Buzios called uh, I want to say it's called Sacarema. Um, and it's got like a famous old church and beaches and stuff and kind of like a chilled, chilled beach town and, um, definitely, definitely another cool spot. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many cool spots here in, uh, also when you, when you go down from Rio to the state of Sao Paulo, there's a lot of beach Mm -hmm. towns there as well, which, you know, don't get a lot of foreign visitors, 
But uh-huh. yeah, there's yeah, a lot I think of you, I even saw that you made like a, a travel guide to Parachi. Yeah, Parachi. We were there in um, just uh, a few weeks ago. So yeah, Parachi is very nice. And many people told me that it's full of tourists and that it's really this backpacker hotspot. But um, right now it's not the case. I think might be because some people are not traveling, but it was actually mm-hmm. very, very relaxing as well. And it's probably if you are into colonial architecture, you know, if you like the mm-hmm. Oaxacas and the this kind of town, the Antigua Guatemalas, then Pachi is, an, uh, is a must in Brazil because it just has most of this colonial architecture and it's the best preserved one, I would say. Yeah, and they have a Salina Hotel there. Oh, everywhere has a Salina Hotel, I would say. Maybe not Pusios, but um, there's there's a lot of them, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I actually went to the, when the Salina Copacabana opened, uh, it opened in like December 2020, and I was one of the first guests. They were still kind of working on the building, and I was able to stay there while they were still working on the building, and I got like some insane discount and stayed there for like 20 yeah. bucks a night, ocean view, like it was super dope. That's great. Yeah. So I was checking it out, but during the carnival, they were asking for like $100 a night for a oh, private sure. room. So yeah, I'm they sure. definitely use that time. But it was, I mean, I went there to to the bar. I don't know if you if you got the chance to go to their rooftop bar. Maybe it wasn't open it yet. It wasn't even open yet. It was under construction. Uh, you know what I did? You know what I did is um, literally, it was literally just like cement walls, like nothing. Oh, really? And so I just like, but the stairs were just like open. And so I just like walked up there, like into the construction site and like, you know, like I was just kind of being a badass, like, but it was completely <laughs> like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Was, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now it's basically, if you, if you guys, or if any of, of the people listening are digital nomads in Rio, it's probably the coffee, it's a coffee shop slash bar slash restaurant. And it's called Flora. And it probably has the best internet you will find in any coffee shop in Rio. So if you need to get some work done, then that's the place to go. And there's, you know, mm. there's so many digital nomads there and also lots of Brazilians. But yeah, it's just a very good spot for, you know, to, to get some work done on your laptop. That's awesome. And we'll kind of uh, move on from Brazil. I could talk about it forever, but I, I mean, yeah, it's a, a huge country as well. So there's a lot yeah, to talk about. But, so was this your first time in Brazil? Yeah, this is my first time in Brazil. Well, I've been to the airport a few times, but that doesn't count. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool because, you know, you're, you're someone that, uh, as we've mentioned, you've been all around the world. Um, you've been to lots of different countries, lots of different capital cities, um, been digital nomading for a while. To me, Brazil is like probably like the sickest country, just the most amazing place. So different than everywhere else in Latin America. What are your sort of like high level thoughts on Brazil? Do you love it? Is it overrated, underrated? Like, did it did it speak to you emotionally? Um, yeah, yeah. Thoughts. So, yeah. So I I have been here for just about yeah one month, and I have to say I tend to agree. So it's completely different from any other place in Latin America, which and that's something I really like because. So I was traveling in Central America last year and. I thought that the countries, all, although they are all different, they are still very similar. But uh, mm-hmm. Brazil, I mean, it's so different from Argentina. It's very different from Chile. It's very different from uh, Colombia. So, yeah, I really like this fact that it's so unique, which is also one thing about the language. You know, they have the, they obviously, they are the only big country that doesn't speak uh, Spanish. And also, you know, they just have so much local culture and local celebrations and traditions which the other countries have as well, of course. But I think that apart from Mexico, you don't see it so much as in Brazil. In Brazil, it's just everybody is so proud of their local town and, and um, state and stuff. As you know, they, they call themselves Paulista and Carioca. And uh, that's something I really, really like about Brazil. So yeah, high level thoughts, I would say it's very different from, from the other countries. And yeah, it's definitely also in my top. Latin America, I would say top top three for sure top three yes and did you find people to be like extremely friendly they say that the best part of brazil is the brazilians yeah the brazilians i mean they are just uh, i think they they are i mean of course we are we are generalizing here but i think that brazilians are probably the friendliest here in south america i you could say that mexicans are on the same level you might agree with that but uh, yeah, Brazilians in South America, they're probably the, the friendliest. 
Um, there, there might be a language barrier sometimes. So if you come here, really got to brush up on that Portuguese. But um, yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. Yeah, definitely. I love Brazil. I, I, <laughs> I can't wait to go back. Um, cool. So I thought we would take a step back and maybe just go through your background a little bit briefly, like what you were doing before you started traveling in terms of where you were living, career, um, how you, you know, got the idea to start living a more nomadic lifestyle, start traveling, and then what you're doing to make money online and how you're able to uh, support yourself while traveling. All right. So, yeah, just a very broad overview. So I grew up in Luxembourg, which is a very small country in Europe, for those who don't know. And um, I was so I, I studied law and I was at, at law school there. And then I started working in the finance sector as a legal advisor, which I did for two years. But after two years, I just wasn't too happy anymore. I just didn't want to do that anymore. So I got into startups and entrepreneurship because I'd been very interested in, in all kinds of online startups during my university years. But I just had I had never pursued it, you know, professionally or, or more seriously. So in uh, 2019, I just decided that I wanted to try and become a freelancer. And I started, you know, working with different startups in Europe. And then over time, I just built myself a career as a, as a content creator. So now I am full-time content creator. I do obviously writing. I have several blogs and I'm also a photographer, which, so I, I sell my pictures to different clients uh, across the world and also on stock sites. And yeah, I'm mm -hmm. also getting more and more into video, which is kind of my, my plan for, for the future. And yeah, that's how I, how I, um, support myself now i've been traveling since 2019 uh, uninterrupted pretty much and i yeah i've been to every diff every main digital nomad hub if you can say so and i've been to uh, 60 61 countries and i should also mention that i've already been i had already been traveling quite a lot before quitting my job in 2019 so i'd been traveling a lot during my university years every summer i basically went on a long two three month trip and that's how I first got to Latin America, how I first got to Asia. And I was basically, I was my, I had my interest in content creation because during those trips, I really met a lot of people who were just doing different kinds of content creation. So lots of them were bloggers, mm -hmm. freelance writers, YouTubers. And I just said to myself, this is the perfect way to combine my interest in content creation and in, in online entrepreneurship with my love of traveling. And that was basically how I got hooked. And then... When I was working in the finance sector, I just, you know, a few months, I, I spent a few months making a plan on how I could actually make it work. And yeah, then I, then one day I, I decided to, after I, I had my plan, I decided to quit. And yeah, the first year was, was pretty tough. And then after I was actually getting a bit more comfortable financially, the pandemic hit. So I basically <laughs> needed to start over again because I lost a lot of my clients, especially freelance uh, clients. I lost many of them in 2020, but, you know, after a while I started building that up again and yeah, that's where I am now. I'm now a full-time content creator and I'm trying to move more into, into video in, in the future. Nice, man. And how, how old are you now? If you, if you don't mind me asking. I am, uh, I am 28. Okay, cool. And did you always live in Luxembourg up until you started uh, freelancing and stuff? Or did you go to university um, somewhere else? Or Yeah, I went to university in uh, Paris and Germany, Cologne. That was mm -hmm. when, yeah, when I was doing my law degree. Yeah. Okay. So like, uh, right. So like, I think bachelor's in Paris and then graduate in Cologne. No, yeah, I did. I did a bachelor in Paris at the Sorbonne University and one of part of that bachelor was the Erasmus program. I don't know if you're familiar uh -huh. with that. That's the European yep, program sure, for sure. exchange. Yeah. And um, so I spent one year doing Erasmus in, in Germany, in Cologne. And then I went okay, back to Luxembourg cool. for my, for my uh, master's. So in, in Europe, we don't have this system like in the US with the law schools. We just have bachelor and master's. So yeah, I did my master's in Luxembourg and then I started working there afterwards. Very nice. So I guess growing up, you spoke Luxembourgish, German, French, French, and your English is super good. 
Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, we learn we learn those four languages at school. So it's kind of normal when you are a very small country that you get exposed to foreign languages at a very young age. And would you say your French or German is better? Uh, f- pretty much the same, I would say. So <laughs> I, I don't use I don't use either language very often right now. Just when I meet somebody who is French or German. But uh, yeah, you know, we, we learn these when we are very young, so maybe five, six years old. So they kind of, you don't lose them. I would say now my English is probably better because I've been working in English for, and when I was working in the finance sector, I was also working in English. So I've been working in English for like five, six years. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, man. And um, nice. And so I think there's a lot of people who are listening to this. Some of them are going to be, already digital nomads they're already on the way they're already doing sick adventures but then some people i think are going to be kind of our former selves where you know we were in a finance job in a cold sort of uninspiring city and yeah. we we're thinking about making the leap and um and you know going off on our own but it's tough because it's like golden handcuffs you know i'm from canada you're from luxembourg basically like the richest country in the world and you know, we're, we're, we come from, we're, uh, we, we won, you know, we got pretty lucky in terms of where we were born. And mm-hmm. I, I call it kind of like golden handcuffs where we have a really good setup. We're able to make money and, you know, I get education and all that. But what, what made you start traveling? Was it, did you, or did you find yourself unhappy in your previous life or you were just looking for something more you wanted to learn about the world or how did you m- finally take the leap? No, I mean, I, I was never really unhappy. I just, as you meant, you said the word uninspired. I think that's a better description. I was just mm-hmm. always a bit of an adrenaline junk- junkie, maybe. I just craved <laughs> adventure, you know. I just really craved adventure. I mean, when I was uh, 18, basically when I was 18, I told my dad I wanted to learn Spanish. And we didn't have any Spanish classes at school, or at least not in my school. And so my dad said, yeah, okay, so you can go to Spain and just do a course there. I said, no, 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 I want to fly to Mexico in a few weeks. And uh, yeah, so I did that. So I just went to Mexico for one month by myself, which is actually my first solo trip. And, you know, I was just Mm -hmm. 18 years old and I was still in high school. And this was just kind of the beginning of how everything would turn out. That's why I still, I mean, I've in some of my Medium articles, I've still referenced this trip because I still have it so much in my memory. And actually, I, I actually met people from that trip, Mexicans, I met them last year, 10 years later, which was really amazing as well. And um, yeah, so so I was just always really into adventure and I could never imagine myself just sitting in an office or just even doing the same thing and just having this this kind of corporate lifestyle where, I mean, it, it all sounds very cliche now, but just this corporate lifestyle where you're just try, trying to climb a ladder, you know, get a pay rise every year and the, you basically have a, a fixed path which is kind of lined out and you're just following that path and i just never saw myself in that even long before i started that job i just needed you know i just couldn't after university i just couldn't just do nothing so i i told myself i'm gonna get a job and then i will see how it continues and i spend a lot of time just exploring other options and that's i think that's what you should do if you're just thinking maybe this isn't for me then you should just start exploring other option slowly because I'm not the kind of guy, I'm not the, the person who says, well, just quit, you know, just quit and try to figure it out as you go along. I know many people do that and I know many people are successful that way, but yeah, it was not my, uh, my way of doing, uh, of doing things. Yeah, I, um, I definitely resonate with your story, uh, especially what's interesting is that you've always been an adrenaline junkie. You know, you went to Mexico when you were 18. But you still decided to check the boxes, you know, go to school, get the law degree, um, get a couple of years of, um, you know, professional work under your belt with like a blue chip company or something just to kind of show that you can do it and that you can kind of go back to that life uh, if you need to. Um, But then, you know, before before you get too, too deep and you get too, too, um, you know, stuck in terms of mortgage and car payments and all that. Yeah. You say, you know what? I did it. I got the degree. I can, I can, I proved that I can work in finance and all that if I want to. 
Um, but you know, I have a different calling out there for me or another sort of reality or another life that I would like to explore as well. And I want to go somewhere with palm trees and, um, yeah. experience more of an adventure. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was always the thing I am personally, I'm very much an, a proponent of saying that you need to try out different things. I think that people who just work in the same career their entire life, they really don't know whether this is the right career for them because you can't know unless you've tried. And when I did my, my law studies, I was just saying to myself, I'm going to at least do one or two jobs. I actually worked in two different companies in, in the finance sector as well because I, I was just telling myself, you need to at least have this experience and just see whether it's for you or whether you have a different calling, as you say. And um, that was for me the most important thing because if I had never done it, if I just become a freelancer after university i think i would have told myself that i i missed out on something because i didn't try it and i didn't get the the full real experience so i think that's very important to get different types of careers and jobs and i think that's for people who who tr uh, are thinking about maybe becoming digital nomads i think that you don't have to become a digital nomad overnight who travels to 15, 20 countries a year. You can just start with something like, I'm going to work in a different city remotely for like one or two months, and I would see mm -hmm. whether this remote work uh, lifestyle is actually for me. And I think I'm very much um, in favor of trying out different sm small steps before you actually commit to the big one. Definitely. And so, so let's... I, I'm, and I'm sure most people who are uh, kind of in that previous life position, they're kind of just like, how the heck am I actually going to make money online? So how did it work for you in terms of how did you get your first freelance cl clients? I think you said you were, you started out basically writing. So were you doing yeah. like SEO type copywriting, you know, yeah. five cents a word type stuff? Yeah. Um, and what kind of income sources? Because, you know, you said you had multiple blogs. I'm definitely curious to have you kind of outline what those are and the money and stuff, but like, that's a long game. That's a long game. It takes a while to get out of Google purgatory. It takes a while to start exactly. ranking. It, start, it takes a while to build an audience. It takes a while for that money to start coming in and it's passive income and stuff, but it's not, it's not, um, it's not, it doesn't put a thousand bucks in your pocket immediately. No, no, no. And that's, that's very important to say. So I started out as a freelance writer uh, on these platforms like Fiverr and Upwork. So people might be familiar with those platforms that are the main mm -hmm. freelance platforms. And they really pay you nothing, basically. They sometimes pay you $10 for an article of five, six, seven hundred words or even less sometimes. So I started out on these just because I didn't really know where to start, just like most people. Mm -hmm. The good thing is that if you are on these platforms and you start getting a lot of clients, you also start getting clients who contact you directly. And so that was what was basically my first, let's say, access ticket. I just got a few clients contacting me directly and they gave me bigger jobs. So basically they said, you can write 10 articles for our travel blog. And they also, m many of these, I did ghostwriting and ghostwriting is usually better paid because obviously they don't show who, it, you, you know, they're just writing as if it was, they're just putting as if it was themselves. So um, right. yeah, that's how I started. But I would say for one year, for one year, I was really not making much money. And during that year, however, I, I was also starting my blog. The first one that I had was uh, Minimalist Focus. And I still have it. And it's actually now one of the, the profitable, profitable ones because it just needs maintenance, but it doesn't need a lot of, um, you know, I don't need to work on it like five hours a day. But I did all of that hard work during the first year, basically. So mm -hmm. for people who are not familiar with, with blogs, is that if blogs have a good SEO presence and if many of your articles are high on Google, you are going to get passive income through ads. That's like the very simplified version. And with the money that I had from the first blog, I actually bought two more blogs, which I'm not going to say uh, which blogs they are because I my name is not on them. You know, I just own them uh, partly. And then I also started my blog, which I'm doing now, which is now my main blog, Jack Roaming. So now I have these four blogs. And obviously with one blog, as you mentioned before, one blog, it's a very long game and it doesn't put that much money into your pocket. But four blogs is already a different, uh, a different kind of um, income. And then obviously I have Medium. So Medium for me was very, very organic. I just started writing mostly about personal growth because 
I'm still very much into personal growth and it's the main topic mm -hmm. of so most people who read Medium like personal growth. There are some other topics that are very strong on Medium, but I would say personal growth is probably the biggest one. And yeah, so yeah. I just grew very organically. I started with zero followers in 2020 and now I have 43,000. And yeah, Medium, so Medium pays you crazy. in... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's people with more, of course, but thank you. It's it's not not too bad. There are... They are um, Medium pays you, as I, as I um, was saying, Medium pays you by reading time. So that means that if you write really engaging oh, no content and people actually read your stuff, then you will get paid more. And that's something I really like about Medium because it kind of motivates you to write really stuff that people like to read and not just, you know, clickbait or whatever. You know, clickbait really doesn't work on Medium because even you can have 200,000 views. If nobody reads your story, you're not going to make any money. So that's what I like about, uh, about Medium. I had and no idea that you could even make money on Medium. Yeah, Medium has a, a partnership program. So I think now they changed it. You need, I think, 100 or 200 followers. And you need some... I think you need a bit of reading time before you can make money. It's a bit of similar to the YouTube uh, system. But um, but yeah, so if you have like a few good stories and people read them, then you can make money, yeah. Because there's a My Latin Life Medium. There might be like one article there from like years ago. I think there might be like 100 followers on it. Um, do you have to write the content specifically for medium or can you syndicate it? Like, can you put it on your jackroaming.com blog first yeah. and then like two weeks later, uh, put it on medium? Yes, you can. So you, uh, medium has, uh, Im an import feature so you can import your articles from a different blog, which I used to do quite a bit with uh, minimalist focus. The problem is that the, the articles that work well on blogs, so basically SEO type articles, they don't really work on Medium. For example, if you have a travel guide or a digital nomad guide, let's say I write a digital mm -hmm. nomad guide for Mexico City. If I post that right. to Medium, it's not going to work on Medium because that's not the kind of content that Medium uh, readers want. So right. that's, that's the problem with, with importing stuff. And also, if you import something two weeks later, it will be shown as... The, the original date will be shown. So basically you will see the date uh, that it was posted on your blog and this will obviously not help the, the Medium algorithm because Medium won't see it as fresh content and they won't push it up. So that's the thing. But if you, if you write something and you instantly import it to Medium, then yeah, it can actually, can actually work if it's a Medium type content. Right. So I know like, you know, I, I think a, a good blog or, or website is going to have sort of a mix of informational and entertainment content. And so the informational for me would be like the city guides and then the entertainment stuff would be like, uh, you know, we have one that's like Latin soul versus European soul. Like what kind of soul yeah. do you have? Like, you know what I mean? And that article is maybe five years old. Could I just copy and paste that, throw it on medium and it'll, it'll start yeah, making a bit of money? Get yeah, but it's not going to get any views because they will, you know, Medium will just see it as having been posted five years ago and then they won't push it up on their on their homepage. So unless you have a lot of followers, then obviously your followers would see it. But mm -hmm. Medium will just see it as if it were posted five years ago on Medium. That's the, that's the main problem with this. What you could do is what I would actually recommend you is if you have an article like that, you could just write it again, but with obviously different words and... I mean, not paraphrase, but write something similar and then just post it on Medium as a Medium original article. I think that mm. then you could you could you can um, can actually reach more people. Interesting. And so, what kind of numbers are we looking at? Like, how many views slash page time does do your articles get? And then, how how much like money does that make? So um, medium, it's it's very like there's not one fixed rate that you get per, for example, per one for hour sure, reading sure. time. So it's very hard to say. But I, I mean, I can I'm not gonna share like the exact earnings, but I can say like what dimension it is. So mm -hmm. my articles they get between some good months. They I mean I had months with a hundred thousand views, but not not at the moment across everything and across all of my medium stories. So I have around two hundred and ten yeah, yeah, yeah. medium stories. And then I have okay. months with 20,000 or even 15,000. So it really, it's really variable. And some months, uh -huh. you know, I would say if you are, if you have, 
internal medium viewers which is basically medium members so you only get paid if medium members read your story and on their reading time um it's basically somebody who subscribes to medium pays 50 dollars a year to subscribe reads your story you will get paid that's how it works and if your your mm-hmm. views are only external views for example if all of your views come from google or from twitter or from facebook pe- from people who don't have a medium subscription you get paid absolutely zero which is kind of um, it can be a bit frustrating because some articles they might have 5000 views but no earnings because all the views come from outside but yeah if you have an article with let's say i mean i can show you i, I can look at an example so i have one here which has 13,000 views. One of my articles has 13,000 views mm-hmm. and it made $500. And I post, oh, I crap. published. Oh, That's way more than I thought. Yeah, yeah, it can be. I mean, the views are all internal. So the internal views are obviously can be worth quite a lot. And But I have other articles that have 10,000 views and only made $50. So it's really hard to, to, yeah, it's really hard to um, to explain to say like one particular number with with medium because it's so variable. But I would say if you have articles that get over let's say ten thousand internal views, you are usually between the three to five hundred dollar range. And if you have twenty thousand, thirty thousand, it can go much higher. So I actually recently talked to a fellow medium writer, and he actually showed me he had an article with three hundred thousand views or four hundred thousand, and his article made eighteen thousand dollars. One article, which is pretty insane, insane. When, you, when you ask me. Yeah. So, but but yeah, if you have, I would say, if you have, if you regularly write on Medium, you have a good audience that who are engaged. Like let's say ten thousand followers plus, you are gonna make five hundred, six hundred dollars a month pretty comfortably because you will have one story every month. That's also something that I should mention about Medium. You will have one story every month that gets a lot of views. And some of your other stories will get no views. So I've mm-hmm. actually talked to many fellow medium writers and they all have the same thing. They write 10 stories and then one gets a lot of uh, views and also a lot of income and the others don't get much. So it's like with YouTube, with blogging, with everything. If you build yourself an audience of members who really consume your content and the bigger the audience get, the more you can have income. So that's... I hope that that mm-hmm. makes it a bit more. Uh, and are are you are you able to put like affiliate links in these articles and stuff? Or you are, uh, you are, but it's against Medium's guidelines, so they will not. Sh- <laughs> basically, okay. they will not. Sh- I'm not. I'm not actually sure if it. I'm not actually sure if I'm saying the right thing here because Medium they change their guidelines and algorithm every few days, so it might not be anymore against them. But the last time I checked, so I should say that the last time I checked, they, it was against Medium's guidelines. So basically, if you put okay. affiliate links in them, Medium will not promote your article. So it will only be shown to your followers. Makes sense. And then do you find that your Medium audience also directs a lot of traffic to your personal blog and to your to your domain? Yes, yes. Actually, um, I would say that a lot of people who read my Medium content, they also... You know, they go through my links. So I have a link tree on, on Medium. And I can see mm-hmm. on my on my link tree analytics that many people from Medium are, are coming there. Yeah. Are going to your blog from Medium. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because I'd be curious if just Medium was sort of like its own sort of contained ecosystem. Or if, you know, you're also engaging with these people on Instagram. You're engaging with them on Twitter. You know, you put an Instagram story saying you know, new medium post drop, go check the medium and then they're, they're going there or is it kind of, you know what I mean? I think that in general, broad terms, it's a bit more of a contained ecosystem, as you say, but I've done, you know, I, I usually share my medium stories on Twitter, but I don't have too many followers there. But yeah, I would say Instagram, I tried it a few times and didn't really get any, any attention. I think that just people okay. on Instagram are not really that interested in in reading (laughs) yeah so they just like to see stories you know instagram stories and reels and is it is it common to do guest posts on medium like if i guest posted on your medium or something is that a Uh, thing no because i i've never seen that actually to be honest because it's just medium is basically you are your own author on medium so many people follow me or follow other people because they like 
one specific voice, you know, a, a voice as a writer. So they like the way one guy writes. And I think that if you started guest posting, you would actually have quite a few followers that you lose because it will still be posted under your name and with your picture because it's like your your personal account. But there's a few publications like Inside, Business Insider and uh, Forbes. Or Data Driven have- Investor you posted in there and that's like yeah. a different like – yeah, uh, but that's media. still my own, my own name, you know. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, and I guess to give people a little bit of context, so your articles are kind of like, how much money do you need to travel full time? Five underrated skills, five ancient tactics, three reasons to sell photos and videos. I actually wouldn't mind asking you about that. Um, happiness is overrated. So yeah, just kind of like self development type content. So- yeah, I have. I would say that my medium has basically three main uh, topics, which is personal growth, self development. That's actually the biggest one, and then uh, travel and digital nomadism. And the third one, which I write about sometimes, not that often, is more like general entrepreneurship. So I've actually focused in the beginning when I started out on medium. I was writing more more topics, but then you know I just niched it down a bit, and it's still very broad, but. That's the three main topics that I think my audience uh, likes to likes to see. Interesting. And then what's your process for writing? Do you get up and write in the morning? Do you just write when you feel inspired? How do you know what writing to put on what site? Because, um, you know, I, I it's tough because, you know, I'm doing the YouTube stuff. I'm doing this and that. I have my full-time job and I'm just like, and I'm kind of like, oh, like, you know, maybe writing isn't the best use of my time. Like, you know what I mean? I could spend yeah. that time building like internal links or doing some other stuff. So it's kind of, it's hard to find time to write. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, I mean, it's a very tough um, time management thing in, in, in any case, if you're a content creator and you are active on multiple fronts. So if you do different things like YouTube and writing and Instagram and stuff, it's always very tough. So I personally, I just have days where I, I will say this day is for writing. So I will basically just write the entire day. I will get up in the morning, mm-hmm. have breakfast, maybe go to the gym, and then I will just start writing until I'm, you know, until I can't do it anymore, like late at night. And after that, I usually have enough content for a few days, so for three or four days. And then I already know in the beginning which article is going on which site. So mm-hmm. I I only at the moment I only write on three play in three places. So I actually don't do much freelance work anymore because I just don't have the time with my with my traveling at the moment so and you're making enough money anyway you might as yeah. well build your so own brand. at the moment you know i still have a few clients and if they contact me with with a good offer then i will still take it but i would you know i don't really do it on a regular basis anymore so i will then have you know i i know that if i write two personal growth articles i know they're going to go on medium then I, I have one which can go to minimalist focus and then I also have one travel, like more travel guide or digital nomad guide, which I will then put on on uh, on uh, Jack Roaming. So I'm now actually trying to get more, you know, writers on minimalist focus, which is my other blog, because I'm just I'm just trying to do more video, and also I'm gonna try to start a YouTube channel in the next few months, and um, that's why I'm trying to to write a little bit less because yeah, it's very time consuming. Luckily is that with Medium, for example, I've just written so much on Medium that I kind of know what works by now. And I don't write an article, like spend three, four hours on it and then get nothing for it. Because that's the case, what you were telling me. It's that you don't really know if writing is a good uh, use of your time because you don't know what the result will be, if it will make you money or if it will just push your business forward. But if you have the experience of you know being on Medium for a long time, you just kind of know yeah. that this... I mean, of course, you can't predict a viral article. I mean, everybody who says who says they can't, they, I mean, I think they 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 are lying because it's impossible. Because I've written articles. No, I think in- for me, it's more like like my Latin life has a pretty good domain rating, and if I write something, like it'll rank and it'll do okay. Like it, you know, I you can look at the analytics, and the article will might be on first page, and it'll probably get a couple of views every day, which adds up to like you know hundred something a month or whatever. But then I'm kind of like. You know, instead of the three articles it, or three hours it took to write that article, maybe I could have um, done something like super high value, like super high leverage that makes 
thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. So that's kind of the like entrepreneur yeah. dilemma. That's and the I'm thing. In. That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, if you have like really big projects going on, I personally, I'm actually working, starting to work now on another, which will be a kind of a big project, but I can't really say anything about it yet, but that will take up most of my time. And when I have a project like this, then I will just say, okay, I'm going to spend most of my time on that project and I will not do anything else, you know, because it's just, if you try, I'm, I'm not a big fan of multitasking. I just don't think it's a good idea to just do many things at the same time because you end up in the end, you can't really direct your energy. And I think that when you, when you really focus your energy on one particular project, you will have the bulk of your correct creativity and you will just do the, have the best result afterwards. I mean, that's my, my, uh, my way of doing it. But yeah, I mean, if you, I think that if you have a blog and it's already, it's ranking very high, like my Latin life, because it's, a, it's obviously a very high authority source for Latin America content. I still think that it, it still makes sense to write a lot of new content because you Definitely. know, you, you also have to show to your readers, or not, not you, but in general, bloggers have to show to their readers that they're still active. Because otherwise, readers right. might think that the information is completely outdated, which was, um, which was the problem of many travel blogs in the 2020s. Because they were, like, they were not updating anything, and people just didn't know if the, the information was still, was still correct. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, we definitely spent a good amount of time talking about writing and medium. And honestly, it was super interesting and helpful. Um, I thought for a second, we were talking um, offline beforehand a bit about Nomad Capitalist. And then also you just mentioned getting into YouTube and yeah. what you think your YouTube presence would look like. Um, you were saying something and I said, no, 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 let's wait till we're, we're on the podcast. So you said something about how like nomad capitalist, how something about uh, like the format and about how uh, nomad capitalist's content is sort of uh, unattainable for most people, something like that. I mean, what was your thought there? Yeah. So, so, so obviously we talked a bit about nomad capitalist and yeah, I think it's a great side of course, and there's a lot of great information, but I just think that, when he's talking about this citizenship for investment, for example, and when he's talking about buying property, I think that for many people who are a bit younger, who might just be starting out as digital nomads, I think that the mm -hmm. entry barrier is just a bit too high because, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but most people don't have $200,000 lying around when they start as a digital nomad. So that's why I think that there could be more YouTube presence yeah. for, for like, nomads who may not be at that point yet and i obviously i hope that everybody gets to that point at some point but uh, yeah he and he does it on purpose because he's like you know nomad capitalist we work with six seven eight figure entrepreneurs and he's doing that because he, he doesn't want time wasters he wants to be able to charge you know twenty thousand dollars per client he wants of high value clients and he wants he wants to basically filter out the broke people um so i get that but then yeah there's definitely a lot of um lot of room like he doesn't even like if if a lot of the like programs let's just say the residencies that don't cost a lot of money he just won't talk about them because he can't really like make money off it it might be i i don't really know if that's the case but yeah might be the case so i think that there's a lot of ways to immigrate to a country or you know to just get a second residency i mean i'm obviously i'm an eu citizen and in the eu it's just so easy to live in the 27 member states and it's even right. it's very easy to live in many other places so there's a lot of ways to to get residency or get a long term visa i mean i don't know if you have a long term visa in mexico but i heard that it's very easy to get it the one year the one year i don't know what it's called but i do have one. i have a i have a, I have a, a four year temporary visa ah you have the four year one yeah so it's basically one year yeah. and then you have to uh, extend it to four years right um that's one way of doing it i got the four year off the bat oh okay yeah so so there's a lot of ways to get a to get a second residency without having two hundred thousand dollars basically exactly yeah exactly and, and did you but you do have to have a job or you know you have you do have to prove income for that four-year visa in mexico right for mine you don't have to prove income 
uh, the way I did it. But I think the one, the there's a couple ones, and yeah, some of them do require uh, income. I actually just recorded a podcast; it's not out yet with um, this guy uh, Martin Toomey, Offshore Consulting Group LLC, and you know we kind of go into more detail about. Um, the different ways of getting Mexico residency, including the income path where you show, I think between like 2,500 and 4,500 US in monthly income. Um, and that's, that's a path to residency. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a lot more attainable than many of the, the citizenships by investment or the, you know, the, the residencies by, by starting a company. Definitely. And yeah, I mean, so I, I, I only acquired uh, my Latin life in late 2021. And so I've only been on it basically since January is when I really started. So it's really only been two months. And yeah. in that time period, I've, I've released 10 episodes of the podcast. Uh, I think there's another five that are unreleased that are on the docket. Um, and so the, the, a lot of the effort was in the podcast uh, so far. I've also put out I don't know, maybe like eight new city guides. I've updated a lot of old city guides. I've uh, updated a lot of stuff on the website to just make the site stronger, like increasing mm-hmm. internal linking and so forth. I also had to remove some of the content that was around dating and stuff that you're probably familiar with. Yeah. Um, and so, um, n- you know, now that I have a good workflow around the podcast going, a lot of the next step is to start creating sort of digital nomad or nomad capitalist style content where it's going to be like, you know, what are the five easiest residencies in Latin America and mm-hmm. this and that, and really, um, really going hard on that front. Um, and so, uh, yeah, people should definitely stay tuned because I'm going to, I'm going to really go hard on that stuff. I think we might even get to the point where I'm going to start like a full scale, like immigration st- agency immigration law firm practically that would be a very interesting project i think because yeah i mean especially for the the american canadian market i think that most people who are digital nomads there or who want to become digital nomads i think the first place they will look to go is probably latin america and specifically mexico just because for you Mm -hmm. guys it's it's very close I mean, for, for Europeans, it's a bit further away. And they ca- the kind of Europeans, they have like the choice between Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Asia. Well, Asia is still at the moment is still much more difficult than Latin America because of, you know, entry restrictions. But it, it seems right. to be, it seems to be softening as well. So yeah, I think that it's, would, it's for, especially for the, the uh, North American people, it's going to be a very, very interesting uh, idea. Yeah, man. It's, um, yeah, I'm going to do a lot of that stuff. We're going to get into the the residencies and stuff. We're going to get into like investing in real estate and just more advanced topics. Like, yeah. you know, like I, I, like I know a lot about like the dating stuff and the girl stuff. And when I acquired the blog, I was like, you know what? I could just be a millionaire real quick, like talking about dating, selling some stupid, like, you know, Latina dating mentorship, blah, blah, blah. But there's too many I of those. Like, I think there's too I, many of well, those. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Is there? I don't. I don't know if there is. I mean, but there's definitely there a, there's definitely a lot of yeah. lame dating coaches. But, um, but uh, but I was like, you know what? I I would I wouldn't feel proud of that work, and it, I wouldn't be leaving a good legacy uh, around that stuff. And so, you know, I took sort of like the longer path where you know I, I removed a lot of the dating content. Obviously, the the traffic took a hit. Um, but try to just like manage that transition well, because ultimately we're trying to get into the more, uh, high value content of, you know, the, like I just mentioned, you know, uh, yeah. investing in real estate, relocation, immigration, second passports, residencies, offshoring, um, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, lowering your taxes, basically being the nomad capitalist for Latin America and, um, yeah, man, I, it's stuff that I'm super passionate about. And I think that uh, certainly COVID has taught us that, um, you know what I mean? Like a lot of things that we thought to be constants, whether it be visa-free access or travel restrictions or, you know, the the nation states themselves and the stability of a nation state, with you know, Ukraine and all that, like it, it's extremely important to have plan B to have Mm -hmm. options to be internationally diversified. And I think you as a digital nomad, 
you know, you probably identified this super early on that, you know, it's important to be a world citizen. It's important to speak multiple languages um, and uh, be kind of like a James Bond type of person. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree because I'm personally right now, I am very much in the in the travel adventure, you know, let's say, uh, episode of my life, because I still want to go to a lot of new countries. And I also want to pick up the pace a little bit for for my travel, because I traveled very slowly in 2020 and 21, for obvious reasons, because I, you know, it was just so annoying to do a PCR test every few days and all that stuff. But now I'm trying to pick up the pace again. <laughs> but I know that there's a mm -hmm. lot of... Um, there's a lot of uh, digital nomads who really don't even want to travel that much. They just want to be at one place Chill. which they like. Yeah, they just want to yeah, be like just some place like yeah. You're just from you're just from somewhere that's just not as good as where you could be. Yeah. Basically, like when I when I first started traveling in Mexico, I went down originally with a, a friend of mine from Toronto. First place we went was Playa del Carmen, Mexico, back in 2018. Um, he basically just stayed there. He's been there for like. Yeah three and a half years straight yeah, he's like yeah. no nah, dude like this is sick it's good balance you know yeah. good weather it's cheap blah 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 it's fun activities and yeah. i was like you know what like Playa del carmen's awesome but i also got into this and started making online income in order to see the world to learn not just spanish but multiple languages yeah um to you know to get a broader perspective to set up several bases and um I, I obviously appreciate people that, and basically I, anyone that, if, if you leave somewhere that's like cold and snowing half the year and there's no sun and you just set up somewhere warm, like uh, that's, that's pretty much the end goal. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that people that are digital nomads are, are, and move every month are better than people that stay in one place. I think no, staying in one place is, is good too, and whatever it, works yeah. for you. And I, I'll, yeah. I'm sure I'll slow down at, at some point too. And, um, um but yeah but uh but um <laughs> yeah like you but said. again i think that it's again i think that it's very important to if you are if you are just starting out as a digital nomad i think you, you should probably try out at least two or three places because you still you still don't have enough experience to be sure that this one place is right. the best let's say you go to playa del carmen i actually went there in 2012 and i can tell you i went back uh, um last year and it's just such mm -hmm. a complete difference, man. You can't imagine. <laughs> like 2012, Playa del Carmen was probably paradise. I think it was. I mean, maybe it was just because I was so young back then and I just wanted to party. But it was just, I mean, for me, it was the best place back then. Today, I'm not mm -hmm. so sure. But again, it's everybody's personal preferences. But if you just go to one place, Playa del Carmen, and you just stay there, I mean, I don't know. You just, you might be much more ha much happier in somewhere in Thailand or in, I don't know, Poland. It really depends. So it's, I think it's a good idea to at least spend a few months in one place and then the next place. And you can always go back to, to that place. Like, for example, if you're talking about Mexico again, Mexico City is probably my favorite city in the world. And I always go back there, even though I, I never spent, I would probably not live there for one year straight because, you know, I, I also want to see other places and I would want to have a little bit of beach and I know that I've actually seen that in many of your episodes, you say that you don't like cold weather and snow and stuff. So I actually, I actually need my cold weather at least a few months a year. I can't just <laughs> be in a, I could not live like the whole year in Mexico in where it's always hot. I just need my, my, my cold weather sometimes. And that's why, but I still, I still go back to Mexico city pretty much every year because I just, I like it so much. I know people there now, you know, because I've been there many times and it's just, uh, I think I, I, I have this kind of lifestyle, but some people, they are just going to, after trying a few cities, they will say, this is my city. I will stay here now. And yeah, that's a very, you know, valuable point as well. And it's just traveling. This is one thing which people kind of underestimate with the digital nomad lifestyle. It's just very, very exhausting. I mean, it's just uh, mm -hmm. after a while, you're just so tired and you just want to stay in one place for at least a few months. Definitely. I definitely agree. And I, I did have a, a random kind of question. So uh, you said that you typically stay someplace like two, three weeks, maybe a month. But yeah. like, are you staying in Airbnbs or hotels? Because you often get a really big discount if you stay a whole month yeah, versus yeah. two to three weeks. Yeah. So I usually stay in Airbnbs. And 
I sometimes I get a discount, sometimes I don't. But I usually just text the Airbnb uh, host and I ask them for a discount. I know this strategy has become more right. well known now, and Airbnb is actually trying to crack down on it. But you know, if they have no oh, guests, really? yeah, if they have no guests, then they will give you a discount because you know they still they still prefer to rent it out for a little bit cheaper than not rent it out at all. So yeah, sometimes sure. if I see the price for two weeks. I just text them. Yeah, uh, I I would ask if it may it's if it's maybe possible to get a discount because I really like your place, but it's not really in my budget. You know, something like that. And I would say sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, but uh, yeah, it's true that if you sp- stay an entire month, you get a much bigger discount. Yeah, it'll be like half price. At least yeah, if but if I stay month. if I stay for like if I stay for like two or three nights, I will just go to a hotel. You know, because it's just easier. Some something with a reception that I don't have to wait for the guy to come and give me the key, and you know. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah, I don't know why, but I really want to ask you about Africa. Like, how much of Africa have you been to? Not not that much, to be honest. Uh, mostly North Africa, Tunisia, um, Morocco, and Egypt. So yeah, I'm not really an Africa expert. It's actually the continent where I've been the least. So yeah. Okay. But I I, re- I really thought you were going to been like, oh yeah, I've been all over Cote d'Ivoire and No, no, <laughs> unfortunately. Something. Not not yet. <laughs> not yet. Um <laughs> but definitely definitely in the future. I mean, Africa is probably probably next year. So this year I already have plans for pretty much the entire year, but uh, next year I am going to go and see more of Africa because it's when I look at my my map where I've been, Africa is like the big mm-hmm. hole. Fair enough. So you're saying that you have most of 2022 planned out? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, not everything, of course, but I still have some countries in Europe where I haven't been to. So I'm trying to finish those off, but I don't probably in mm-hmm. summer because, you know, Europe is much nicer in summer, especially Southern Europe. And then I also want to go to the US because I just haven't been for a very long time, like five, six uh-huh. years. And then uh-huh. ov- at the end of the year, I, I want to go to Asia again, to like Indonesia, Malaysia. But, you know, you have to see whether they are open, under what conditions, and yeah. And so how important – do you have like a goal of going to every country in the world? Or how important <laughs> is it to you to to like – Yeah, I mean, some people have asked me that whether I want to visit every country in the world. But I don't have that goal right now at this moment in time. But that doesn't mean it might not be my goal like in the future. But right now my goal is 100 countries. So I'm, I'm 61 and my goal is just 100 countries. And then we will see. And yeah, that's why I want to pick up the pace a little bit. So I want to get to a hundred in, um, <laughs> and yeah. O- over, uh, so you can surpass Mark Zolo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't even know uh, how many countries he's been to because I can't, I f- he, he did stop traveling, right? Or is he still, tra- I think now he's, he's sailing. I think he's, at like, now he's sailing. He's at like a hundred, he, he, he was at like 110, 120 before yeah. the sailing trip, I think. Um, yeah. Interesting. 120. And yeah, so it will take me some time to get to that level. I think so. I think so. I think it's definitely over 100. Uh, are you familiar with the the um, the organization called Counting Countries, where it's like all these guys that are like the most traveled people yeah, in the yeah, world, I've, and they I've go to that. all the different the sub regions and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I've actually been to quite a few unrecognized places. So that's one thing, you know, I, I really love these places. It's just so cool. Last year, I went to Transnistria, um, and I also oh, wow. went to uh, Western Sahara, which kind of is Morocco, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sorry mm-hmm. for everybody from Western Sahara, but there's absolutely no, like, it's not a place like Transnistria where it's different people and different language, and it just looks like Morocco, and yeah, and there's a little bit of Spanish presence. But yeah, I've also, no, I haven't been to... Uh, yeah, I think those are the two main like breakaway regions that I've been to. But I'm actually planning to go to another one very soon. So if you're following me on Instagram, you will uh, you will see that. And yeah, I really love these places. It's just uh, it's so much fun going there because the people there are usually super cool because they're just happy that somebody comes to visit their their country, which they can't even find on the map because it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And you said that your favorite city in the world is Mexico City. Yeah, I would say. So actually, I have people always ask me, what are your favorite countries and cities? So I would say favorite cities is Mexico City, Bangkok, um, Istanbul, 
And then the other two, maybe Tokyo, and probably in Europe it would be Vienna. These are my interesting. That's a oh that's maybe a good maybe I should say Hong Kong. Five. Maybe I should say Hong Kong. Hong Kong would be, I mean, the fifth spot would be between Tokyo and Hong Kong. Interesting. And uh, what do you like about Mexico City? Mexico City, it's just that you know it's so much. There's so much culture. Like in terms of museums, it's definitely the best city in Latin America. I think there's no competition in terms of culture. So I really like culture. I like going to museums. I like seeing art. And that's something I really like about Mexico City. Then, you know, it's just the nightlife is very good. You know, you have these areas, uh, Roma, Condesa, and all this uh, Reforma. All these areas are just, there's so much going on, so many bars and restaurants. And also there's a lot of co-working spaces, coffee shops. You know, you just never get bored. The infrastructure is good. The metro is relatively good. And also the connections are good. You can go by bus to anywhere in Mexico or you can take the flights. You have, um, I mean, it's pretty safe if you stay in the right areas. If you don't wander into Ecatepec, then uh, I think you should be fine. But um, yeah, I think overall it's a very good, very great place oh but what i should say is what i really love about mexico city is that when you stay in one of these areas like uh, roma and condesa then you really don't need to go anywhere else you can just stay in this area the entire time and you just you know you're good mm -hmm. you just I like walk Cuyo everywhere can. yeah i will just i will just put on my my uh, light for a second because it's it's sure. gotten dark sure. yeah go for it Yeah, sorry for that little break. It was just that my it's gotten dark outside while we were having the the call. So yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah, you're four hours ahead of me in Brazil. Yeah, um, I'm curious from your perspective as um, as a digital nomad and as a European digital nomad, what are the biggest hotspot digital nomad hotspots in Latin America? In Latin America, um, I would say number one is probably. The entire Mexican uh, Riviera Maya, so I would say Tulum, Playa del Carmen. This is probably number one. Number two, maybe Medellin. Um, yeah, I think that those two, like I would say that most digital nomads, European digital nomads I know, go to either one of those two. Then um, maybe Buenos Aires, but Buenos Aires they were very very strict last year, so they kind of fell off the map a little bit, I think, and. Maybe Rio, but also at the moment I didn't really see that. So, yeah, I would say yeah, Medellin and uh, Mexican Riviera Maya. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's definitely consensus around Playa Tulum and then Medellin being number one and number two. Uh, you could probably argue which one is number one or which one's number two. But then I feel like after that, it's like a complete free for all, and numbers like three through ten are like. There's no like consensus around like what else there is. Yeah. I would say Buenos Aires is definitely one of them because it's just so cheap. I would say Mexico City is one of them. Yeah. Um, I would say probably other places in Colombia um, are up there, but there's really Cartagena, not a yeah. lot of Cartagena. Really? I don't know. I of, mean, like long term I've, digital I've, nomads that go there though. Yeah, I think that I. I mean, I've been there a few years ago, and there were quite a few, but yeah, by far far less than in Medellin, that's for sure. And also far less probably than in Bogota. The thing is, Bogota, again, it's the capital city, so it has the best connections and like the best uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of say anywhere with a Selena Hotel is probably one of the digital nomad yeah. hotspots. But yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, I'm actually just curious if you could run through like number three to number 10 uh, from your perspective, like what's kind of on your radar as a digital nomad hotspot where people not just go for a visit, but actually maybe like base up and, mm -hmm. you know, there's kind of a critical mass of, of smart people working online. Okay. So in Latin America, I would say, yeah. So the, the two ones that we mentioned, then I would say Buenos Aires, probably number three, but I would say actually probably the top 10 taking out Buenos Aires, the top 10 and Rio. So let's say the take, taking out Buenos Aires and Rio, the top 10 are all in Mexico, I would say. I would say there's Vallarta, <laughs> there's Mexico City, 
there's also um, Oaxaca and Puerto Escondido. Even though I went to Puerto Escondido last year and the Wi-Fi there is absolutely terrible. So I don't understand how anybody can work from there. But yeah, it's like the more the people who like mm-hmm. this, more like hipster vibes, I guess. And um, I guess also um, uh, Sayulita is there's lots of digital nomads there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think these are all the ones in Mexico. I think that in uh, in um, oh in uh, in uh, what's it called Costa Rica, but I forgot the name of the place. There's one place in Costa Rica with lots of digital nomads. Uh, Puerto Viejo, Santa Teresa. Yeah, might be that one. But um, and then Those there's are one two place. Different places, yeah. This bit, but yeah, like basically Puerto beach Viejo. towns of Costa Rica. Yeah, <laughs> yeah all the, the beach towns. And then San Juan del Sur in uh, in Nicaragua. And yep. also Antigua, Guatemala, there's quite a few. But yeah, yep. I think these are still in comparison to like the Tulums and, and Playa del Carmen. There's just like they are nothing in comparison. So yeah. But I think that anywhere in, in Latin America, which is like relatively affordable, which has somehow somewhat decent internet and which is reachable, I think anywhere you will have digital nomads. I think that's fair. Um, there's definitely, it's weird because the Wi-Fi is like pretty much decent everywhere in Latin America, or at least passable and pretty much everywhere is cheap. Pretty much everywhere has good weather, but for some reason it's just like very like overweight in like a couple cities. Yeah. I guess it's social media and the marketing around it as well. But, um, yeah, with the Wi-Fi, I mean, the Wi-Fi is good if you have like the the if you're staying in an Airbnb, for example, you really need to check with the host because sometimes they have like the cheapest the cheapest Wi-Fi plan available, and if you need to upload something or let you know have a Zoom call or anything, then it gets more problematic. Like, um, yeah, if I mean, just, I'm doing this stuff for yeah. this podcast because I'm like, people are I can't even schedule a week in advance because I don't even know if my Airbnb is gonna be good enough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I usually ask them when I book the Airbnb. I usually ask them what is your internet, and then they say it's this much megabytes, this much megabytes. Well, so, they say I don't know how to test, and I'm like, just go to speedtest.net. Come on, yeah, they're like, I yeah, don't yeah, know yeah. how to do it. I'm like, oh no. My God. Sometimes they say, sometimes they say I don't know. It's like um, solo la solo it's, la it's compañía good. tiene esa información or like something <laughs> bullshit like that. It's like no, the company isn't. You know, something like that. Yeah. Like when we were in Rio, they were actually they actually said like the Airbnb guys. We asked them how fast is the internet. They said, "Well, it's uh, I think it's fifty megabytes, but when it rains, it's less." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> That's definitely since true, when, though. But but since when, it's I mean, not below I, ground. Yeah, that's probably the problem. But they were saying that like as if it was the most normal thing in the world. Like if anybody in Europe told you that, an Airbnb guy, you would just say, what? Why are you still on Airbnb? They would probably report them and say, this guy said his Wi-Fi is bad because of the rain. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Yeah. Those are the, the Latin America, you know, stories that you will ha- hear from people. <laughs> so, yeah, let's let's wrap this up. Um why don't you give us like one one uh, one good travel story? You know, you're obviously uh, an accomplished storyteller. Is there any story that you like you'd uh, want to share with the audience that'd be kind of funny or adventurous? Uh, just let me think for a second. So there's there's just so many. Maybe maybe I would say in uh, the Philippines, I was in this in this island which is called Bohol. And I don't know if you have heard of that place, but it's a very, very beautiful island. And it's a small island, so there's no airport. Or there might be one, but, you know, like a charter airport. No real airport, let's say. And so I just rented a motorbike there. And the guy obviously didn't put enough fuel into the motorbike. And I asked him, is the tank full? And he was like, yes, yes, of course. And I was like, okay. So I just trusted him. And so, yeah, I was just running with my motorbike by myself in the jungle in Bohol. And, of course, it ran out. And then... I just had to wait for like two hours, but then the amazing Filipino people, they just, the first guy who actually came, but it took two hours because it was in the middle of nowhere. And the first guy who actually came just went to the next store, which was like a few kilometer, few miles away. And he just went to the next store and he just bought me a Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola bottle with fuel. 
which is just how they do it in, in these islands in the Philippines. And he just filled me out. And the guy didn't speak English, which was kind of rare because in the Philippines, most people speak English. The guy didn't speak English. He, we couldn't communicate. He just saw that I had run out of fuel. He didn't even ask for anything. He didn't even speak to me. He just saw, ah, you ran out of fuel. And he went, got me fuel and was on his way again. That's just one little story out of, you know, how amazing people are when you go like to more remote places where they, you know, where <laughs> they, it was just like, I was just like, I wanted to thank him. I wanted to give him something for his fuel, but he didn't even ask. He didn't even want any money for it. So yeah, that was a really cool experience. I've heard so many stories about bikes breaking down in Asia and just people coming out of nowhere with like the perfect part. <laughs> yeah, whatever. yeah, that's, that happens. The thing <laughs> is that in Asia, you know, in Asia, just everybody has a bike. Like bikes are much more common than cars if you are like not in a big city. And yeah, the, the parts are just very easy to get. So if you just need a part, like somebody in the next, like even a, a little convenience store, like in the Philippines, convenience stores, they have like Coca-Cola bottles with fuel inside, which is pretty cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, a little, little change of subject. But yeah, dude, uh, definitely keep me updated with what you're up to on uh, 2022. It'd be sick to meet up at some point, get a beer. Yeah, it would be great. Uh, we should also, you know, try to collaborate on a little bit of stuff. You could guest post on My Latin Life or maybe me on, on some yeah. of your platforms um looking forward to what you do on youtube as well uh is there anything you. that you want to promote or share with the audience before we go so for me the the, the platform so if you if you obviously if you if you are on medium you can find me there at uh, jack career k-r-i-e-r -E or if you just want to follow me on instagram jack roaming and that's where i'm basically the most active on instagram you will see what what i'm doing and also my my links are all on there so if you want to stay in touch just follow me on on instagram and yeah that's it so just just one question are you staying in mexico for the rest of the year or are you also planning to travel a bit more um i'll be in mexico for at least the next month and then i'll be bouncing around for sure um actually this sunday i'm taking the overnight ferry to la paz oh, in cool. baja california sur i didn't even really knew i didn't know this ferry existed I and then, <laughs> um, but from Mazatlan, um, you can take an overnight ferry. It's like a 12 hour ferry. You get a cabin. Um, and yeah, it brings you to Baja California Sur. And, uh, so I was like, this is cool. I've never taken a cruise before. I've never taken a, a long, long haul ferry. So, um, cool. definitely a little bit of a, a bucket list thing and, um, should be interesting. There's, there's some amazing beaches over there. Right. Yeah, I haven't been to that part of Mexico, but it's definitely also on my list. Mm -hmm. It's like the very tip of the peninsula. Yeah. So yeah, the what happens La Paz is, and, yeah. Yeah, what happens is a lot of people, like motorcyclists and whatnot, and overlanders, they'll go down, they'll cross over from California to Tijuana, and they'll go all the way down the Baja Peninsula, and it's huge. It might be like eight, an eighteen-hour drive, and then you know you're almost sort of stuck there, right? But then you can take a ferry where you can put your motorcycle or your car or RV on the ferry and cross over to Mazatlan and Sinaloa yeah. on the mainland. And, um, you know, you're on the mainland and you can, you can go about your way. Yeah. That's a quicker way to, to get there than drive all the way back, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty epic. It's pretty epic. So that's coming up real, real soon. But um, yeah, anyway, Jack, man, just want to thank you so much. Merci, gracias, obrigado. This was actually a really, really, really good conversation, man. I enjoyed this a lot. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed it as well. And I hope we can collaborate in the future. And obviously, best of luck with my Latin life. So I've been following it for a while, and I'm sure you will just turn it into something even better. Definitely, man. Thank you. Thank you. So have a good night. You as well.